And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple of returning good brothers to the temple, part of the double-headed monster that is Three Hound Games, and... The creators of Mythos, which will soon be making its re its return to crowdfunding in due time. In the red corner, Jason Chambers, and in the blue corner, James Be James Beneda. How you two doing? T how you two doing? It's I know it's been quite a while. It's it was it was actually it was almost a year ago since I since I have had you guys in the temple. Yeah, yeah, almost a year to the date. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we are a, doing that sounds about right. Doing. Yep, doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. So, I've been all I've been all right myself. Just to, just because of certain companies acting like idiots, things have things have accelerated to the to the point where I'm starting to get flashbacks to the '90s, where everybody everybody's rushing in to fill the void of the of the of this exodus that seems to be going on. Yeah, I will say yes, due to uh, that misstep. Um, we have heard that there's been a lot of uh, flooding and everyone's rushing to the gate to, uh, again, capitalize on this and jump on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so I even yeah. heard your interview last night um, uh, with the young lady of, um, oh, I'm going to get it. Bar was it Barrow World? Was that um, Har Harrow. Harrow World, thank you. Yes, and saying how... Uh, you know how, how they made their move, which was shocking that they were with the one who shall not be named, and now moved over to the cipher system. So yeah, yep. Um, and I had I had predict I had predicted that eventually something stupid was going to happen, and then a bunch of people would either stick with what they knew, or or um find or find new alternatives because I had already I'd already seen that um. Not too long, not too long before this happened, about a about a year ago, when Games Workshop decided to be Games Workshop again, for all the wrong reasons, um, a bunch of people jumped ship from Warhammer 40k over to BattleTech, which isn't a one for one jump, but that's the jump that ended up happening. And I saw a similar thing with a bunch of World of Warcraft players because of how completely sick of of everything that they had been put putting up with for the last couple expansions in and sh the most recent one Shadowlands in particular they ended up jumping over to either Lost Ark or um, New World for a hot minute until New World ended up going belly up or um, Final Fantasy 14 and the lesson the lesson that can be learned from that is um, do not take do not take your audience for granted because if you fuck up, somebody is going to fill the void. Uh, never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. In the words of Napoleon, that is a great quote. Um, it, it, yes, and again, but oh, again, when we first talked about this a year ago, we were never you know, granted. It, it, this opens up an opportunity for us. We're even more grateful for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it was never a, um, I don't think we're ever going to try to compete with, uh, not that we would want to, but to compete with the big two, right? No, say the two that are in the void. Most of the people who are, who are either jumping ship or, or building their own stuff aren't, aren't interested so much in competing as mu as much as just doing something else. Right. Well, I think our, yeah, I think our started with, yeah, I think our start with again, like we talked, we talked about, was we were doing five E, and it just we just kind of picked it up, and again with the collage of systems that we had, um, just kind of chose what worked and what didn't work, and kind of like Jeet Kune Do, right? Throw out what doesn't work, put what's in, and make it your own. Yeah. Now, there's there's obviously been been some been some development since the last time that I co that I covered Mythos. Um, I do appreciate you guys sending sending me that document, but what would you what would you say were some of the things that you learned from the early playtesting, and some of the things that were good 
seemed to be good ideas at the time, but but get but ended up getting um t- ended up getting taken out because it potentially wrote you into a corner. I'll let you start with that one, Jason. Um, that's a that's a pretty good question. Um, I I wouldn't say we've necessarily taken things out more than just changed how they functioned. So, for example, uh, enchanting. Mm-hmm. Enchanting is one of the things that when we, you know, when it was first written out, there was a lot of detail going into it because in other systems, you know, that have come out recently, enchanting has just been like, you know, make a roll. Hey, it's enchanted. You know, there's not a lot of depth to it. And wrote the enchanting and then recently have gone back and, and looked at it and went, you know what? we can do this better to where we can streamline a few things, still keep the depth, but not necessarily be as wordy of a document or, or keep it, you know, a little bit more cleanly written. Mm -hmm. So I know that one's one that has been a a change. Another recent one that we did is uh, fighting styles. I know that has changed from our first iteration with it to the new one. Uh, our, 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 I would say our, final iteration or current iteration. So fighting styles very much at the beginning were like, hey, here's like five techniques, you know, just kind of a few things, you know, for if you're using a bow or staff or fencing or whatever. And now it's definitely evolved to having beginner level techniques and intermediate and then master level techniques. And, you know, how do you, you know, growing that pool to make it worth somebody putting the time in and investing that with their character using, uh, spending their adventure points to purchase these techniques, like really make it worth their time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that was, I do remember in one of the earlier drafts, I think there was, there were some notes about fighting styles, but it was very similar to the to the fighting style class feature that you see with with some of the with cla- with classes like the fi- the fighter and a few others in the world's most litigious role playing game. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. a that was a starting point, and as I said, we definitely wanted to make it our own and kind of really dive into those. And Jimmy did uh, a lot of work on those, so I'll I'll let him pick up from here because I know he he's put in a lot of work at expanding that. Yeah. So I, again, I like take fencing. Fencing was one of the ones that I took a look at it knowing that there was a lot of things that you could do uh, in fencing that was that I think maybe a lot of games didn't bring to the forefront with the exception of social of GURPS uh, because they just you know there's just so detailed uh, but what you don't see in standard uh, d20 systems so uh, you know typically it's dual attacks dual defense everyone's using a rapier and a main gauche or a dagger well, I wanted to bring in the fighting. I wanted to bring in like the cloak. Uh, that was a weapon that was used. So I kind of wanted to branch off and to where e- even if someone did take fencing, if someone wanted to take a fencing style, you could still make it your own and not be just cookie cutter. Here you go. Uh, that was, that's, that's the one that I could think of off the top of my head where you really uh, went that way. And, um, when we went with the more esoteric uh, ones that we lined up for the martial artists where we had those aligned with the colors of the dragon where uh, every fighting style was done a little differently to where it still all felt like a monk, but everybody was just different enough to where, again, it wasn't cookie cutter. Mm-hmm. And that is that is something that I appreciate because I've... I've mentioned this in the past. We this idea that fighters that fighters or martial characters are meant to be Babby's first character is something that I want to see dead and buried. Well, the other thing that we want to take approach with the fighting style is it just isn't for martial characters. Anybody can take a fighting style, so we don't want. Now, granted, no, we just preface it with the fighter is always going to be better at fighting styles and using it and doing that than everybody else. But that's not to say that another character couldn't use it. 
So we did want to make them, uh, I think with the exception of uh, some of the monk stuff, I think we did say you had to be a martial artist. Like that was their little niche. Um, but again, we wanted it to be universal. Um, because again, right, like you could go tomorrow and go down to a martial arts place and go learn tie fighting now. You'll never be a tight fighter and get in the ring and go fight for money because uh, you'll never be at that level because that's not what you do. But you can still learn to, the basics of tie fighting. Mm -hmm. So I kind of took that approach when we were making the fighting styles is that it was universal because anybody can learn how to fight. Just yeah. some are better at it than others. And the other the since you mentioned monk, the other thing that can that can crop up is this this issue of a one-size-fits-all approach to um, unarmed combat, where you, you look at a lot of games that have the that have a monk or a pugilist or a martial artist class, and there's there's never there's rarely any details about specific fighting styles or specific schools of of combat. So, to break down the monk, like I mean, I didn't go crazy with Shaolin, Crane, uh, Tiger, you know, the Bando style, the five animal styles. Uh, I, I believe what I did, I have to pull out the book, because it's been a while since I've actually looked at Monk specifically, uh, was I think I took that, and then based on the school, like the dragon, because it was all based off the colors of the dragon, mm -hmm. uh, you then went into that kind of specialty. Uh, so I didn't go in depth and say, well, you know, if you're in the water and you're with the blue elemental, you're gonna say do uh, say dragon style. Where if you're in your mountains, you're doing eagle style. It, I was trying to look at that, but how to make that work and the mechanics in a D twenty system. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'll go back and revisit it. But there's only so much I can do based on a D twenty. It's not like uh, you know, I hate to say it, but GURPS is a lot more built more towards that with the way that it's done where d20 isn't really built towards that i can again it's something i have to take a really deep dive in it and take a look uh, but i will say that we did go in depth like in the styles in the area in our world in the southern islands uh unarmed combat for instance uh they have their style is based off the hawaiian bone breaking art Mm -hmm. So everything that they have, if you were down there, is based off of throws, locks, and bone breaking, which is completely different than what you would have in the north. So in that essence, uh, yes, you would have individual styles based on region. Mm -hmm. And even w now with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, one of the things that was not in the original document that's um, in that, that is certainly in this one. Is the is the concept of paths, and I'm guess, would it be fair of me to say that paths are are kind of the are kind are kind of the equivalent to subclasses in the aforementioned most litigious game, or the archetypes that you'd see in something like um, Pathfinder first first or second edition. Jason, you want to take that? Yeah, so paths are a very interesting thing when we were designing them. They are templates that you can add to any class. So, for example, one of the paths is the monster hunter. And you can be an alchemist monster hunter, rogue monster hunter, uh, a mage monster hunter. Um, and it does give somewhat of a feel as being a subclass, but by being this universal template, it kind of stands on its own, in my opinion, because some classes typically are, well, I'm a fighter, but I'm a champion, or I'm a uh, mage, but I'm a pyromancer. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we do have some plans in the future for doing like advanced archetypes to where we can go in and say, well, I'm not just a generalist mage, I am a pyromancer, and there's going to be these changes between you know, the pyromancer archetype and the regular mage archetype. So that, that for us, is not quite the way to look at it. it. Paths, a lot of times for us, were this is a 
profession or a way of life or some kind of major thing that represents the life of the character you're trying to make. So, for example, with the Monster Hunter, that's somebody who is dedicating their life to take on the things that go bump in the night. Now, they may be part of a order or a faction of some sort to where they're a part of a group, or they might be a freelancer. Um, but that's... Oh. oh, I think we lost Jason. Yeah. Sorry, am I, am I there? Yep, there you are. Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, the Monster Hunter is, is one way of the path, but in terms of the whole nature of it being a, a way of life or a major part of the character's life is the Beast Companion. That's another path. Hmm. So that... What's different in our game is, again, it's a universal archetype, so you don't have to be a ranger to have a beast companion or a druid. You can be anything. And it's just, it represents the fact that you've gone through this major event within your life, which is acquiring this beast companion. Um, Assassin's another one, right? It's Yes, it is a profession, but it's also something that is going to be uh, something your character would dedicate themselves to. So, Paths have a very interesting place within our system um, to where you can look at it in a few different ways and it you know it really shines as a way to customize your character to the to a new level in yeah. my opinion um, hey, just to add on to that real quick so mm -hmm. like you were saying like a, a subclass we also I know we are talking about multi-classing uh, so if you wanted to be a fighter but you wanted to be an assassin, in the most litigious game system, you would have to dip your toe in and take levels in it. And I always thought, well, that's taking away from what you really were, which is if you were a fighter, you're taking away from a fighter because you have to give up levels for that. Uh, so we came at this with the, with the mindset of, well, why do you just have to be a rogue to be an assassin? Mm -hmm. It's a profession. Anybody should be able to learn it. And, then we just took that and then, of course, expanded it out to uh, all the other ones as well. Yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, with the approach that you guys ha have have for it, is it a, is it a case? And maybe I maybe I missed this in the document, but is it a case where you have to where you have to spend you have to spend a certain amount of AP? just to buy into a, to a path or is it just get is it just you're in that path once you have it once you have the once you meet the prerequisites and you get one of the one of the um abilities in it uh, so there's no so, prerequisite to be a path I'll get to it, but it does cost ap points to get it so if you want to say take scout mm -hmm. and then you want to increase your levels in scout now you as a player have to decide where I'm going to spend my AP points. Uh, do you want to be the best scout, or do you want to continue to build your character? Because again, AP points do every is the driver in our game. Mm -hmm. That raises your proficiency. You can raise your stats. You can get your saves. Yeah, you can buy your talents. So uh, again, it's that balancing act of. How, where what what direction what road do I want to take my character down? But to just to be a scout or be an assassin, uh, there's no initial uh, buy-in. You just have to pick right. the path. Now, I would say that there should be a role-playing aspect to this, right? There should be a reason why it's not like you're sitting out in the woods in your party and you're just coming back from whatever mission your DM has you on and. It's like, hey, you know, you guys got 10 AP points. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to be an assassin. Well, how are you going to do that? You're sitting in the middle of the woods. Mm -hmm. So I would like to think that a GM would kind of look at that and say, let's let's figure something out to take you down that path. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and as Jimmy was saying, you know, there's no buy-in in terms of you spending your adventure points. Um and for example, like if you're if you decide you want your character to be to have a path at the very beginning in character creation, you know, um, all the paths give you two abilities right off the bat that are completely free. You know, 
Uh, like for the assassin, it gives you some skill points and weapon proficiencies and things like that. So you can be, you can take that right from the beginning. But now again, that's that's a major part of your character, so that should be reflected in your backstory, mm -hmm. um, or it should be notated in some way. Like, hey, are you freelance? Are you a part of an uh, an assassin's guild? Right? You know, what's the deal there? And then if you choose to not take a path a character creation because it is purely optional it is not something that is a requirement for every character uh same thing with the fighting styles completely optional it's a something if you want it you can take it if not basically then in play in the in your campaign you have to have it quote unquote you know unlocked so to speak through gameplay because again like jim was saying it doesn't make sense to be out in the middle of the woods and just be like yay i'm an assassin now it no you know, you got to find somebody who's going to teach you. And then is that you joining a guild or is that you maybe coming across somebody who is on the run and is teaching you things, right? There, and again, that all that all gives the GM opportunities for story in the campaign. Like, hey, how, how is this campaign going to navigate the fact that this person now wants to be an assassin? Mm -hmm. So, and then once they find that person to teach them and, they can go ahead and uh, start learning. Again, they'll get those first couple uh, abilities for free. And then again, as, as you were saying, after that, if you want to keep uh, getting more things, you then are spending your AP to take new abilities or increasing the ones that you already have to a uh, stronger rank, things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, given that, given that um, and given how every... every all roads lead to adventure points. Within the full on within the full on book, do you are you planning on putting um, bits of advice as far as what would be a good point spread to essentially but essentially budget the different steps? Um, I, I don't know if I'm not sure on that one because everyone designs it equally. Um, and the reason I'm not trying to do this is a throwaway answer. We even tested and play testing a way to do it where you don't even pick an archetype. And you spend your points and just build your character without a fighter, rogue, wizard. Mm -hmm. You just basically do it that way. Um, so we will put in examples of how one could build and where we allotted the points as a as a example uh, i don't know if it, and maybe i'm answering this wrong or maybe i don't understand it fully understand the question i don't know if i would put it in and say well if you want to do a rogue fight uh, a rogue excuse me a fighter assassin you would put 50 points towards your basic ap and then 50 points towards assassin mm -hmm. uh, so i don't know again that would again that's completely up to the player how they would want to spend their AP because we have seen people go all different kinds of ways at conventions when we test it on the way that they want to build. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we yeah you know, obviously we got to give them a roadmap because you don't want to go crazy, uh, but we will kind of guide them. But ultimately, it's it's their decision, and because again, you can build a pretty powerful character coming right out, but again, what you pick for one, you're going to sacrifice on the other. So it. It does lend itself to, um, I guess, min-maxing, I think Tim always calls it. Uh, you can't do that, but again, you're going to be very weak and weaker uh, in this system if you've been maxing in others. But uh, mm -hmm. I, again, and, and, I think we would just give them templates. Right, and, and min-maxing doesn't mean your character is complete garbage, but if you're, if you are, you know hey, I specialize in using my sword and I'm really good. I took all these talents to make me better at attacking with a sword and defending with a sword. That's great. You will be the best sword user in the group. You, you'll be able to hit consistently, deal damage consistently, but your saving throws, your skills, all the other aspects of your character are definitely going to come up lacking, and then that will be what you have to focus on in the campaign mm -hmm. versus someone who builds more well-rounded is not going to do as good as the person who specializes with the sword, but on the overall, they're going to be able to do a lot more with their character being more versatile, being more spread out. And everybody has their their viewpoints on that. Like Jimmy said, uh, we've had people, when they build characters, they 
don't take a lot in terms of what the archetype gives, but then they'll take a lot because they want to focus more on the assassin part of the character versus the fighter part or the rogue part. Mm -hmm. So for them, that's the point that they want to put in. Or they're just like, hey, I really want to be the skill guy. Like, I'm the go-to person in the group. I'm the one picking the locks. I'm the one who knows things. I'm the one who navigates us and does the tracking. Like, that's that's the part they enjoy. So they go heavy on their skills, and they're not as great in combat because they're spending points on skills. And that's the choice they made. But, you know, who, who are we as game designers to say, you have to make your character this way? Mm. You know, that that's part of the system is it's all about choice and customization. So you can do what you want, just choices have consequences. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, when you guys were de- when you guys were designing, um, what was kind of the dividing line between a archetype and a path? Oh, I think we actually oh, that's, took uh... one of our yeah we actually took one of our archetypes, which was the scout. Yep. And then turned it into a path. Uh, yeah. when we first looked at it, and I think alchemy was, I think alchemy we looked at as maybe a path, but then we ended up turning that into an archetype. So I think that came with, when we were looking at it, from our from our point of view, it, did it lend itself enough, and was it credible enough as a player? Like, did it bring enough to the table that a person would want to choose this and when we first put it out there, nobody took it. When we had Scout, nobody took Scout. Because everyone was like, eh, you know, it's it's kind of like a fighter, but it's not. And it's not quite as... Not quite just, a ranger, just, but it's Yeah, we just, we just couldn't seem to find a way to make it really work. And if you're, if you're just taking from other other archetypes to fill in space then kind of like we were talking about before right you're you're really not as powerful when you talk about being underpowered and i think mm-hmm. that's where we came up with the scout where we're just like oh man this is just it's just not that good let's make it into a and make it into a path and it works out a lot better as a path yes. and then with Absolutely. alchemy alchemy was alchemy i think we looked at it and jason just kind of went overboard uh with the alchemist and we just decided to make that into a into an archetype. So I think it really lended to playability. Like, and again, as, as a player, would you want to play it? Mm-hmm. And again, when people looked at it, no one really chose the scout. That was the one thing that nobody yep. looked at, and it yeah. never really blew any you know blew wind up anybody's skirts. So they were just like, ah, about I don't even know if I can say that anymore. So sorry about that. No um, worries. Nothing. nothing to <laughs> um, so, so yeah. just to just to, just to tack up. Yep. Did we lose him again? Uh, we might have. Sorry, it, it's my phone. It keeps shutting the screen off and time and out, and it ends up cutting off my call. So, I apologize. Um, Jimmy is completely right, and uh, just to tack on to what he said real quick. Uh, our scout at the very beginning was, hey, we got this thing from the fighter, and we got this thing from the rogue, and we got this thing that's kind of like the monster hunter path, and you know, and it just really felt like a gap filler when there really wasn't a gap that needed to be filled. So we had uh, a friend of ours say, well, this kind of seems like a ranger, but a ranger is just a, a fighter who's good in the woods and knows things about herbs and the woods and you know, or they might have a beast companion. Like, but at the basics, they're still a fighter. And we're like, you know what? You, you, in the way that this is built, you're completely right. So we made changes, focused it on the scouting part of it, the terrain, the traversal, um, the woodcraft, and that definitely improved the scout. Uh, a lot of people have talked about it and said, "Oh, it's got its own fighting style. That's that's pretty cool." And oh yeah, there's these great things for being like you're the tracker, or you're the one who leads the group through the terrain as a scout should that works and then and just uh oh, or it, it, it just okay. to interject on that we do have a gentleman who's play testing and he took scout as a path and he was commenting on how useful it is because as a scout it does offer like a lot of things that you would 
think right. You're in your favorite terrain, you get bonuses. In your favorite terrain, your enemies get negatives. You're not going to get lost in your favorite terrain. Like these are the things that, like you were, like we were talking about earlier, right? Mm-hmm. You should really understand the woods and understand your environment and be one with that environment. And I yeah. think that's where the scout kind of goes with that. And, and to finish it off, I think we first looked at that. As we said, you know, you just do it for the sake of doing it because that's the way it's always been done. I think because every other, just about every other tabletop RPG has Ranger, I think we felt obliged to put it in and we were trying to force it. Mm. And it just didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I could Absolutely. I could I could certainly see I could certainly see that. Um now one one particular question that I'm guessing you guys have you guys have had get br- get brought up to you is is it po- is it possible for somebody who started out as a mar- as a martial centric character like say started out as a fighter to eventually start learning magic through spending adventure points? Absolutely. So, absolutely with the I believe do we have to have? Do you have to get Majory like zero at there the beginning? Is, is that- there is a there is a caveat. Yes, you must yeah. take the talent of magic potential um, at character creation. Only the lowest level. That's mm-hmm. the only one that is required. Um, and that and that doesn't even mean you have to learn spells or anything. It just means you are born with the potential to cast magic. Doesn't mean your character knows that they are. It just means that it's there. So uh, they can do that. And then play through, and the GM can throw something in there where, like, you know, they get really stressed out, and all of a sudden a spark of flame shoots out, and they go, wait a second, I got magic? Yep, mm-hmm. you do. Um, and then they can, from there, learn magic from somebody, or find scrolls, or books, or whatever the case may be, to then be able to increase their magical talent to a higher rank, gain the ability to cast higher level spells, gain the bonuses, you know. Again, they won't be um, you know, I said this is a fighter doing it. It's not going to be the same as a mage because the mage has its own things that make its spell manipulations and things that make it special. But mm-hmm. there is nothing stopping a fighter from casting ninth, uh, our, our ninth level, tenth level spells if they dedicate the time to it, upgrading their magical power. Again, they can't do all the extra things. They can't extend the spell or you know, empower it or any of that, but they can still cast it, and it's a, you know, hey, I have those, I have the mana for it, boom. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind, um, one thing that I, one thing that I did find kind of interesting, it, and I may have mentioned it beforehand, but the variety of, co- of colleges, some, some of which are going to be familiar, others, um, a little bit less so, what made, was what made you go with this ex- this expanded approach to the point where there's quite a few um quite a few quite quite a few entries when it comes to the spell list when we when I first thought of this uh, when we were I guess when I was kicking it kicking it down the road and talk with Jason about it <clears throat> for me when a mage entered a battlefield when a wizard entered a play in my mind how i see it to me it was very lord of the rings-esque it's like when gandalf showed up when Mm. gandalf showed up or any wizard showed up you knew it was it was it was about to get real because no one else really had it i mean a mage ruled the the field Mm -hmm. and i really kind of wanted that Uh, i wanted that feeling i wanted that awe that a mage hits and i wanted the mage to be as diverse as a mage could be and I don't know I just wanted a wizard to feel I guess like they were it yeah. so I wanted them to have this wide berth of spells that they could take I mean to me it's very in, in my opinion it was very odd to me that I could take uh, as a mage I could take fire fireball evocation I think but then I was getting dinged on another one like to me a spell is a spell uh, it shouldn't matter how it how what college it's from mm-hmm. uh, and then one of the colleges we did 
choose to add. Uh, and we have that in more, more detail in the back is the food college. And I think that that came from two spots. One, we've always seen the spell create food, but you just created food and it was kind of like a throwaway. Like you just never had to carry food because you just had either a cleric or a mage have it and just mm. create food. Uh, so we wanted to expand upon that uh, for the sense of now when you actually create food, we actually threw in DCs to what kind of meals you're going to make. And that also goes along with cooking. So we actually look at this with our cooking skill as well. Because again, we just don't want it to be a throwaway skill. We wanted it to mean something when you took it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you get different bonuses uh, depending on the meals. And then also my wife made an assassin who was a chef. And I wanted to kind of honor that idea because I always thought that was such a great idea that my wife made this killer assassin who just cooked really well. And that was her way into uh, when she would infiltrate, Mm -hmm. where she made her reputation on doing that. So I kind of wanted her to honor that with the cooking, uh, with the, uh, excuse me, with the, um, with the food college. Mm -hmm. But I think we just kind of wanted that vast, um, the spell list. And when people see it at first, it's a little overwhelming, Mm -hmm. right? When they're like, Oh my God, like, Oh, look at all I have. And and it can be because you get to choose. But on the other hand, like they actually feel like they can do something. Like they're not just, (sighs) I get two first level spells and four Kendros. Mm Mm-hmm. You get speaking 10 spells of, mm-hmm. <laughs> right right off the bat yeah speaking of that um, do you have it wh- do you have it where um, learning spells is ju- is just as much an AP situation or is it a case where um, players would have to find would have to find spells during their adventure so you can find spells or you can buy spells. And when you buy spells, you still have to learn spells. So I think Jason came up with this one, and I'll let him go into this a little bit, using um, downtime. So downtime actually means something in our in our system. So Jason, if you want to talk about that one, since you kind of constructed it. Yep. Yeah, so just like everything else, learning spells does cost AP. Uh, we, we said, hey, the, the casting cost of the spell is how much AP. So uh, minimum one, obviously. So a cantrip, which costs zero uh, mana to cast is still one AP, but if it's a ten mana spell, it costs uh, ten AP. You know, pretty pretty simple. But again, just like with the paths, you don't just learn a new spell out of nowhere. Like it's not like you wake up and you go, "Hey, I didn't know how to cast fireball before, but I can do it now." No, it takes study and training, and just like with our skills and with the fighting styles and um, paths like you have to have you have to find the information through gameplay mm-hmm. in a book or you have a teacher or something and you have to spend downtime to learn it now to most people downtime is oh we're taking a break from our adventures and there's a one year time gap that's downtime no you have downtime every day you're you're at the at the camp at the end of the night and you've got maybe like two, three hours before you're going to go to bed, that's downtime. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to study to learn my new spell. It's going to take me eight hours to learn it, two hours every day. I can learn it in four days. And then you just spend the AP cost, and now you have that spell. And once you have it, you don't have to memorize it. You don't have to uh, select it as like, these are my ten spells that I can do today. No, no, no. You've learned it as a mage. You can, you have um, the ability to, you know, use that spell whenever you want. You you know that spell. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. And taking now with that in, with that in mind, um, have has and have you has anyone been put in a situation where there were difficulties managing health, stamina, and magic energy? Ooh, not managing it, no. I will say we did learn in playtesting in the very beginning that we had to back off. Um, the fighter we found on our first uh, iteration of it was um, extremely overpowered. Uh, mm-hmm. Because you could you know, use fatigue or stamina 
um, mm -hmm. to do an extra action. And we didn't at the time have uh, mage recapped for anybody. Like, so anybody could do like what, what a mage did. So we had fighters, guys who would take fighters, take magic, would burn through their stamina pool because fighters have that action to take a knee and recover their stamina pool. Mm -hmm. These guys would just, these guys were the best casters on the field because it would just burn their fatigue, reset it, launch a ton of fireballs, reset. So we we're like, mm, no. So we did find people who managed it, but managed it really well and found a way to break the game. Yeah. And which that's, that's play testing in general. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is, Yes, you have your stamina, you have your mana, to, mana, and you have your health. But I mean, when it comes down to it, they're really easy to keep track of, and they apply to very specific things. There's not really a lot within our game to where it's like, hey, you can expend mana and or, or stamina, or mana and stamina. Like, no, it, it's usually spells use mana. Your fighting style techniques or taking extra actions; those are going to use stamina, and then you have your your health pool. Mm -hmm. I just said people, I was going to say, they, they will empty. We found that out. Like, they, to control their mana pool, uh, we've watched folks just completely empty it. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I'm just going to rain down the heavens. And then they're like, oh, yeah, that was a pretty bad idea. Or they hold on to it. They're very miserly with it. And they won't really use it because they know, you know, it's not like, the most litigious game where you get it back the next day. Mm -hmm. So we've seen it. I, to me, it's an extreme. I've never seen anybody really do it to where they're thinking ahead, like, okay, I have this many days to go ahead and do it. I'm going to use this much. I've never had anybody actually sit down and calculate it out. It's almost an all or nothing. It's mm -hmm. very, it, and that one is very odd that in our play test, that's, that's really what we've seen. Yeah. Yeah, def yeah. Definitely at the very beginning, at least, because they're not used to it. I, I will say, I think. We've had a couple playtesters, like, once they started playing it and getting used to how often, how fast you can recover your mana, and mm -hmm. the fact that it is in increments and it's not all at once, then they kind of learn, oh, you know what? I'm going to save this till we hit the big boss. Then I'm going to go all out mm -hmm. and hope that we don't need anything on the way back to town or, you know, save maybe a little bit for one big spell after the boss just in case. So people do eventually, they start to learn it. And and that's the great thing is you see people who um, are, are playing this game and they're used to playing RPGs a certain way and realize, oh, that doesn't work here. I have to learn the, the ins and outs of this new system. And as they start to pick it up, it's a really fascinating thing to see that kind of like aha moment, light bulb moment where it's like they're starting to get it. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of that Speak of the most litigious role-playing game. I'm curious if you guys have plans for not not anything specific in terms of crunch, but just the general idea of create of creating some of creating some sort of conversion advice. Ooh, I don't know if there's a what. Honestly, we when we first were thinking this up, we did think about how can we convert it? And although it seems very similar, and I've, we've had people call it uh, Pathfinder Light, uh, I don't know if there's a way to do a one-for-one. One. I think we've came up with a way to maybe do creatures, but only one way. Like we figured out how to maybe convert uh, some of the most litigious games creatures uh at least a guide to to our system um but there's no way to really go back because in our system just starting out as a 50 point character um you're essentially a third level character as i think is what we figured it out as mm. like there is no yeah. level one i'm a mage i'm going to get stung by a bee and die yeah uh that's not very heroic which is another thing that our system wants to. Uh, is you do feel heroic in here, uh, so uh, that's another positive uh, yeah. that people seem to like. 
so there is there is no conversion and we we really did start out with that road like i really was thinking we should really should make it convertible but to me if you make it convertible is it really your own is it, is it really a system or is it just a clone that you can kind of almost fit into it yeah. and just make just subtle changes and then it's you're really not playing another system you're just playing a knockoff essentially of another game that's doesn't have a soul of its own and that's and that's not really a bad thing for some people. They they aren't interested in creating a whole new system. They want to create a setting, right? That works, or they want to make a few creatures that work. But when we started this, I, I think Jimmy and I were both on the same page. They're like, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna make our own system. It has to be our system, right? There are certain things that we can't get past with it being a D twenty system, right? Mm-hmm. You know. We, we could go ahead and be like, oh, we're not calling it Constitution, we're going to call it Endurance. Or we're going to call it Agility instead of Dexterity. Like, there, there's minor things like that. It's like, that's not really worth our time to change. But, again, like Jimmy said, if it's something where you can pull, you know, a character out of 5th edition and put it in our game and it works just fine, is it is it our system? Yeah. And, and the answer we came up with is, no. <laughs> and... To that end, to that end, obviously, I, obviously, the doc, none of the documents that I that I have thus far have gone into monsters. So there's a few things I'd like to ask. The first is, do you do you guys have plans on putting in a full custom system for creating monsters and creating encounters? Actually, we do have that. You just don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I kind of. Uh, we kinda do, yeah, we it. have the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think our I think I'm up to 200 some odd creatures currently. Um, yeah. But I will say this: if you want to know like what our creatures look like, I'll I'll be honest with you. If you grab uh, probably the most simu- similar uh, one, I could say is if you were to look up in Gerb's Beastuary and look how kind of like how theirs is broken down and done, ours kind of follows along probably that same path. That would probably be the closest one I could tell you is. Look at a GURPS uh, fantasy folk beast worry, and mm-hmm. that's kind of how ours breaks down, just because of the way the system works. Well, um, also uh, for, and this is for the listeners as well as you, Mildred. Uh, we have posted a couple of our creatures with their stat blocks to our Facebook, our Instagram, and our Discord. Uh, right now, as of as of right now, we've got a hell troll and another creature called the Shadow Zealot that are mm-hmm. are currently uh, there. And we just, you know, we write a little blurb explaining, like, what they are and kind of things to look out for. But the full stat block is right there with its abilities and stats and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to take a look at what creatures will look like in our system, that that's a pretty straightforward way to do it, too. Yep. Now, with that in mind, obviously the more litigious role-playing game had the, had a method of... Of try of trying to measure the difficulty of specific monsters through challenge rating, which is something that I've been critical of for years. Uh, when it comes to when it, when it come, do you do you guys instead use the say the a, say the AP range of, of a given encounter to determine what would be what would be what would be a good idea or a bad or a bad idea to put it against um, players? So I think we came up with two. One is AP, right? Kind of look at your party and then look at <clears throat> where the creature falls in. The other one is the DR rating mm-hmm. of the creature. Obviously, if you're coming out there and you don't have any augmented weapons. But I will say this. Even even in our system, combat is extremely deadly. Uh, we found out at cons and playtesting that we might do 50 AP uh, characters for everybody to use. No magic, just mm-hmm. straight there because you do have damage multipliers in our system according to the weapons. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've had to look at this and go, wow, even lower level characters, what we think would be a challenge, uh, they're mowing stuff down. Mm-hmm. Uh, so again, right, for a player, it's a great, great that you're taking this down, right? Because again, you feel really good doing it. As a, as a game designer, you're like, wow, man, I really missed a mark on that. Um, but really, we use the DR. Like, when you start looking at the DR, can these guys handle a DR-20 
12 creature. Mm -hmm. If your answer is no, then you have no, unless you're putting it there for a particular storyline reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. It has no business being there. So we kind of use the DR for, for me anyway, like when I do it, I use DR more than I will will use AP because there's a lot of times that I'll throw paper tigers at folks. So, um, just to just to see what they're going to do, or the equivalent of and, rust monsters, if you feel like screwing with people. I'm not <laughs> you. Um, I don't do rust monsters. Uh, I don't do that. I don't do that one. Uh, and and just wait, as so a we're... quick additive. Oh, sorry, God. I was going to say, yeah, I haven't got there yet with a rust monster, but that's a good idea. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um. Just a, a quick additive. There, there are a couple other things too. We we have a, a star level mm-hmm. for our creatures um, that range between one and five, and that kind of measures the threat level. Uh, again, we base that off of the DR and the creature proficiency bonus. Um, also, some like how many attacks do they have? You know, what are their abilities? So we do try to look at a few metrics when assigning that star rating, but it's also a measure of like how rare the creature is. So if you come up against a one-star creature, that's going to be something like a wolf, a bear, something that's really common, mm-hmm. versus a five-star creature is like the Kraken, your big legendary creatures, or you know so-and-so, the Necromancer, who's got a, a knight and a name or a title. So yeah. we, we have a few different metrics, and what we found, because again... Looking at creatures in the beginning, we were like, oh, can we do a challenge rating system or can we come up with something? And what it really comes down to is when you when you break it down to literally just that one metric and you kind of say this is it, the variability with player characters can really make that kind of a metric unreliable. Mm-hmm. So while we do have a star rating... Jimmy said, like, we're looking at DR, we're looking at abilities, we're looking at, you know, how powerful the creature is, how, how what's the average amount of damage it can throw out with an attack. Like, it, it, it has been, I would say, one of the more challenging aspects, because like Jimmy said, we, you know, there's times where we throw something at players in a con, and they're like, wow, okay, you just destroyed that in, you know, two rounds of combat. That was that was not the encounter we thought it was going to be. Okay, we got to make some changes, you know, up some up some DR here, or add some health here, or whatever, you know, increase damage from attacks, whatever the case may be. Um, and then other times, you know, we'll, we'll intentionally throw things like Jimmy said, Paper Tigers, where it's like, hey, not a lot of health, but, you know, it might two-shot somebody. Mm-hmm. So. Or if Jason's running a campaign, he throws harpies at you and almost kills your game designer <laughs> because he really didn't think that went all the way through, and yeah, I just so happened. Oh, I, I thought it through just fine. I, I had uh, I had a great time with that encounter. It was great. It was you guys didn't expect the strategy. No, we did not. <laughs> so again, it, just a harpy. Like I mean, whatever. But it almost took us out. So, mm-hmm. uh, but I will say this: you did get a beginner's guide. We did give you the beginner's guide right earlier. Yeah, yeah. But that in was, the back of the be- that was a that was the- a year ago. So I didn't. Yep. Um, I didn't put too much focus in that for this interview. Okay. So if you want, in the back of the beginner's guide, there's a whole little starter adventure mm-hmm. that actually has the creatures and things like that that you can take a look through afterwards if you were still interested. Yeah. Um, since you mentioned a star rating, and, and you already gave examples for for uh, one and one and five, um, I'd like to go through the other three and just what, just what would be a few examples. Um, starting with what would be an example of a um, two star um, encounter. Yeah. Uh, sure. Let me so, go ahead. Pull that up. Yeah, right uh, go ahead, Jason. You know, pull it up. But typically, from my point of view and, and from what we try design wise to look at, is a two star creature means the creature has proficiency bonus of plus two, plus three, and you're probably going to have one, maybe two attacks for the more dangerous versions. Um, something like, um, I would say, uh, well, uh, ironically, no skeletons in our system. Also, an animated so, guardian cloak is a two star in our system. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I uh, think since we... Jimmy's got those pulled up, we'll let him take that yeah. from there. Yeah, and then um, I think, um, like, just a, I think what they called a, a brawler, like the armor, again, is a two star. 
Um, we have that there. Uh, let's see. For three stars, let me see. Our hill three troll. Stars. I know that is a three-star yep. creature. That's a three-star. There should be some undead in there for some three stars. Mm -hmm. let's see, rare. Um, I think a shade is a three-star. Um, I think we have a shade as a three-star. Uh, just because of the special abilities. Um, not so much the proficiency bonus, because there's only a proficiency two, but due to um, the special abilities that it has, mm -hmm. we move that up to a three. Because again, in our system, you know you have health. It's not like the other systems where as you increase, you have to buy your, you have to buy your health up. So <clears throat> a lot of people forget about that. Um, I think the Sand Mummy is another... Um, one that is a two to three star, depending on how you want to uh, run that. Mm -hmm. For a four star, I think we jump up to like adult mountain drakes or um, adult or legendary mountain drakes mm -hmm. would be a version uh, of a uh, four star creature. Giants. Giants would Giant. fall into that four-star category. Yep, humanoids. Yep, uh, rare. Let me see. Uh, Archangels. Uh, it's definitely a four to five. Mm -hmm. um, then I think we also have. I forget. I think our slimes actually are pretty. I think we have some there that are actually our slimes are pretty brutal. Uh, can't remember. I can't remember right. I yeah, we, we tried to uh, we try to put a few new spins on certain creatures, uh, just because people are used to walking over, mm -hmm. especially like skeletons. That was a big one for us. People are used to just being like, ah, I walk up, you know, I might get hit once or twice, but I'm just gonna destroy it in a couple hits. So we you know, we got to thinking like, how can we make a, a skeleton exciting? And it ended up being a a modification we made for all undead. Um, so because weapons have damage multipliers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, piercing it does times two after damage reduction, slashing times one and a half, uh, bludgeoning will lower the DR of uh, creatures who are wearing metal armor or stone. Um, we decided, well, for undead, they're going to ignore that. Mm -hmm. So now your weapon damage takes a, a plummet, and now it's like, ooh, okay, that, that, that this, isn't, this is a little bit harder. So, um, and s slimes and oozes and things like that was another one where it's like people just think, oh, you know, oh, it's a, it's like it's a jelly cube. I can just slice it up and it gets smaller. And uh, it's like, well, what if those cubes could get back together, or what if multiples of them could merge? Mm -hmm. You know, and get big, even bigger, right? So we try to put some twists to really kind of keep people on their toes. And again, keep it to where people understand what they are. Right, so there is some familiarity with it, but again, make it so different that you're not going to be able to pull out a beastuary and go, "Oh, this is this is how I do it." Uh, so, yes, uh, we also have things called embers, which are uh, souls that were burned from being undead. Uh, they rise up. They um, you can go anywhere from a three to a five star on those, depending on how many wound points you want to give it. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, as a GM, you have flexibility on how hard you want to make these. So we did give it a good range to where you may have one at a 45 health, and everyone's like, oh, okay, that's not a big deal. The next one you throw out, it's like 70 health, and now they're like, uh, that's not working the same way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So again, as a GM, it gives you a lot of room uh, to maneuver. Yeah. Now... One particular thing that I wanted to experiment with is I would I'm going to go through I'm going to go through each of the basic classes from the world's most litigious role playing game. Um, I'm not going to be covering subclasses with this because we'd be here all night, obviously. But I'd like to go through them and how how one might take the general idea of their kit and put it into Mithras. Okay. So, first, barbarian. So, a barbarian you would take 
the fighter archetype, then you could use the Berserk uh, talent. Uh, so you would be able to go to Berserk, mm. uh, which I guess would be accustomed to their rage. Uh, weapons, again, uh, <laughs> the difference between their Barbarian and our Barbarian is that you can actually wear armor and choose any we weapons you want. Uh, so yeah, again, I'm, you're not not... I'm not factoring in weapons and armor with this because... Uh, we don't have totems, mm -hmm. uh, but if you wanted to use some kind of totem or animal-esque uh, thing like that, you could use magic or you could yeah, or you could use divine. So your choice on which way you wanted to go with that as a player. Mm -hmm. So you would take a divine talent or you would take uh, the arcane talent. Uh, I'm trying or to think even, what else... Um... If you just want, like, uh, if you're looking for kind of, like, an ideological thing with totems or belief systems, we have also, like, the astrology skill. So that could be something like, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a barbarian of the co uh, comet totem or comet, you know, sign or something. And you could work it in that way, too. Um, and in here, again, um, so you have your brutal strike, which is your combat dice, I guess, is equivalent to that. Um. So again, as a fighter, you get you get combat dice right off the bat. Um, danger sense, we actually have as a talent, so you would actually buy that. Uh, you wouldn't have to wait to level two; you could just buy that right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure what indomitable might is. Um, and like and I then, said, I I know that not all of the basic class features. Um, could could be applicable. Um, what I'm more going for is replicating the feel of that of that particular class within the myth within the sandbox of Mythos. Yeah. So right. uh, again, yeah, because we thought about that, which is why I think we did Berserk, which is mm -hmm. to cover if someone wanted the barbarian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so next up on the list is Bard. Well, I would say a bard you could do within two classes if you wanted to. So if you wanted to do the Nordic one, you would go fighter. And then you would take, uh, and again, if you didn't want to be big on spellcasting, you could then take your magical talent, and then you would take musical instrument, and you could have things like, uh, what is it, Jason? The voice? Bell songs. Bell songs. Uh, there's also an angelic voice talent that gives you improved yep. performance checks when singing, or um, there's a musician talent for improved bonuses when playing an instrument. Um, and that's just, that's even if you want to include magic, magic. You want to be more of like a spy bard. You know, you don't need magic at all. You could still use fighter or uh, rogue. Or you could even go mage. So any one of those yeah. fight because we took the bard and actually just broke it down. So a bard is basically music, magic, and then some rogue. Well, since rogue is skill based, you could take all the rogue skills. You could take whatever magical talent you wanted, um, and again, depending on if you wanted to be caster heavy or not, you would take the mage, because then you get all your stuff from that. But again, it's still musical ability. Um, if you wanted to increase your looks, right? So I think we had to have handsome and very handsome or beautiful and very beautiful mm -hmm. uh, with angelic voice, a fashionable. So you even actually dress well, no matter like what you're wearing, you always look good. Um, so we have all these little things in here that would, could really play towards if you wanted to be a bard. But again, we just don't limit it to a bard and you're just not limited to all these colleges. Cause I mean, we have communications college. We have the mind college. Uh, we have uh, body college, so you can morph and change. Uh, with the mind college, again, you can focus thoughts and have people do things. Communication college, you can enhance your musical ability and singing ability to make people do what you want. So there's a lot of options when it comes to bard. It's just not just A class. You really can choose how to make your own bard. That's probably one of the more versatile ones that you could do within our system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. So, next up is the Druid. The Mystery of the Druids. Well, again, you could go Mage, um, and then take 
plant college, uh, where we have their body college to morph into creatures. Yeah, uh, we got the plant college. Uh, uh, yeah, plant then you animal can take your elemental body. spells. You know, fire, like uh, fire, water, uh, air. You know, there's multiple colleges there. Uh, and then the other option is uh, divine. You could be a priest and uh, worship one of the gods of the nature sphere, and, and use your you divine know, use your divine what, powers that way. Yep. Yeah. And depending on what depending on what gods you're actually worshiping, it'll be different things. You know, dealing with nature and animals. Yeah. Given that, given that, um, how would you hand one of the one of the things that's been a key feature of druids for years has been wild shape, you know, taking the form of different animals. Um, how would you guys handle that? So we actually pull up the spell here. Yep, it is a it's a spell. <laughs> it is a spell, and we actually have it. And it, well, I want to say it goes by spell points. Sorry, I wasn't uh, prepared to go through my spell list. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Well, go, go ahead and ask your question. I'll pull this up, and then I'll come back to that one. Yep. Uh, well, my my question is how would you how would you handle the equivalent of wild shape, which is which is essentially a shape shifting a shape shifting effect. Um, the key thing is that wild shape is, technically speaking, for a lot of druids in a lot of games, not a spell. It's not taking up spells. It's not taking up spell slots. It is a feature. So we don't have a feature. It would be a spell, but we don't have spell slots. Mm -hmm. So shape change. You are, so well, ours is a little different. So I'm going to go right off the bat there. So here you need five spells from the body college, and you need five spells from the animal college. So shape change is going to have to be something that you're going to have to really want to focus on. Uh, it lasts one hour. However, it only costs three spell points. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it doesn't cost a lot to get it. Uh, but again, once you have it, you always get it. So what it does is you, you you assume the form of the creature. Your stats are replaced by the chosen beast, that you re but you retain your intelligence score. You also retain all your skill and saving throw proficiencies. Uh, and if... If the beast has the same proficiency as you, or higher, then you're going to use the higher bonus. So if you're able to, through this, transform into a creature uh, that you've seen that is a uh, large size that you know was a rare creature that has a high proficiency, you change it, you then get the proficiency bonus whenever you make your attacks. Um, you're not able to use their legendary actions, mind mm -hmm. you. Uh, but again... Uh, if they have poison claws, poison bite, if they breathe fire, you're able to do all that. Uh, once you go to zero wound points, you become unconscious, you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. But your form is gone. So you do get that way. So that's the little variant. You just don't shape it. Because again, everything here is kind of based on a spell. Because we don't have druid as a class. Yeah, that ma that makes sense. Um, so the next one on my list is is fighter. That one I'm skipping because the I think because the answer is pretty obvious. Just the fighter archetype, and that and full stop there. <laughs> yeah, but again, where the difference between ours and theirs is, depending on the AP points, right? You can choose to come out of the box with a critical range of eighteen to twenty. Yeah, you don't have to wait all those levels like. You can buy it right off right off the bat, bat if you have the AP points to do it. Mm -hmm. So I like to shift straight into monk. So monk is our martial artist, and our martial artist. I don't know if we actually have that in the book. Do we have that one in the book, Jason? Not in the that one. That is you not. Sent me. No, it is unfortunately not in the book. Uh, that is because it is planned. Uh, the martial arts is planned as as an in expansion. It is not planned in the the core book. That doesn't mean that you can't be a martial artist uh, in the sense of learning a fighting style and using a fighting style. You just unfortunately are not going to have 
you know, key abilities, chi abilities, I think is actually how we use ours. Yep. Um, it, that unfortunately we, we can't throw everything into the book. Our, our, when we did our, uh, our most recent page count, we're already at almost 400 pages. Mm. So we're like, we've got to make certain cuts and we're going to have to, you know, and it, what it allows us to do is add even more fighting styles and fighting style abilities with that utilize chi that could then be added on to the normal fighting styles in the book. So, but again, they really do. Um, they do get certain proficiencies uh, coming right out the bat. Uh, your unarmed damage is actually greater than everybody else. Uh, you will have a chi pool, so it's kind of like your. Um, Again, kind of like a mage pool uh, mm -hmm. that you get to choose from. And from there, you get to use your abilities from that. So you're not, you're going to be better than a fighter in the sense of um, I can augment it with, I guess, your chi. Um, but it's not like a mage. Just, uh, we wanted to make it where you didn't feel like you were just, it was just magic. It was actually something different than magic or divine we wanted to make it feel special mm -hmm. so we will have that so no we did not forget the monk mm -hmm. so next up is paladin who paladin so that's actually a subclass of cleric it's a war priest um and they are focused more on obviously the martial side of that. So take your wait. So you guys uh, are you guys are having subclasses? I was under the impression that subclasses moved into paths. It's not like a subclass. I don't know. I, well, I guess it. Well, it's a. So let me let me just kind of but anyway. So we have our our archetype, which is the priest. But when we were thinking about the priest, we were like, well, there are different aspects to priesthood. Right, you have your orators that kind of—they're the ones that go out and they're spreading the word and uh, of their deity, and they're you know out in the crowd, and that's their that's their role. You have the clerics, which are the ones that like are studying and learning the divine text and how to utilize the divine power they're granted in a better way. You have war priests, which they're the militant arm of the religion. Like you want to go on a crusade, and you know, or or you just want to you know further the purpose of your you know, your deity in a, in a martial way. There's, um, you know, your inquisitors, which are like the spies and the ones that are out there to look for heretics, you know, for certain deities. Um, so for us, what we said is, well, let's, let's utilize that. So we say, okay, you build your priest and then you decide how are you devoting yourself to your deity? Hmm. Do you want to be a cleric and, be more focused on learning the religious text and using your divine powers? Do you want to be a war priest and be the one who's out there using your divine talents to fight and to smite and to bring the wrath of your, your god or goddess? You know? So that is where it is. It is not a subclass because we're not changing things out and saying, oh, you're losing these abilities but gaining these ones. It's, it's, it's a choice, right? What type of priest are you? Are you going to you know, are you going to be the voice of your God or the army of your God, the eyes of your God, the ears of your God, that kind of thing. Yeah. So it is, it is kind of a, a, I won't say a weird distinction, but it does kind of blur the lines between subclasses and things like that. But we don't consider it a, a true subclass. Mm -hmm. So next, next on the, that that helps clear that helps clear up some stuff because I was, I was I was pondering what I was pondering when sub, when subclass was dropped whether or not whether or not um whether or not you have that and and paths planned. Well, no, I'm sorry. That's yeah. That was my fault. I, I guess it's just such habit. I apologize. Yeah. Um. I get. I get the feeling that I get the feeling it's a case it's a case of old habits die hard or. You'd you'd stumble the ball if I asked you to catch the ball with your opposite hand because you're just playing the odds here. You're probably not ambidextrous. That is true. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. Unfor unfortunately, the unfortunately the 
I know one person who is, and he just happens to be my co-host on a lot of the shows. And whenever I make the left or right-handed joke, he always laughs. <laughs> well, I, I I can I can see that. Okay. But um, next up would be Ranger. So again, we don't have a ranger. We do have the scout path, which anybody could take. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, Jason, do you have the scout doc? I do. Andy? Yep. So, let me just pull that up real quick. All right. So with the scout, um, again, you can be a fighter, you can be a mage, you can be an alchemist, a uh, priest, whatever you want. And then from there, um, you'll get the uh, two abilities from the path, uh, terrain expertise, which uh, gives you your, your favorite terrain type ability. And um, the other one is called a higher standard, which gives you various uh, proficiencies based on what aspects of being a scout you are focusing on so we have like living on the land which gives you focus on first aid and survival and cooking mm -hmm. gathering information you get uh search and street smarts uh move move like the wind focusing on stealth and tracking and then uh strike first strike hard focusing on uh some weapon proficiencies and camouflaging yourself don't think you're um, gonna let then, that cobra don't think you're gonna let that karate kid reference slip behind me <laughs> well really, you know, i missed that one Oh, oh my gosh, okay. you're right. <laughs> um, and, and then from there, the different abilities you take are, are things like um, light light steps, which, uh, you know, help you getting over obstacles. Uh, medium armor training, so you can take heavier armor and have it not give you the same kind of stealth penalties and stuff while you're using it. Um, skirmisher training, giving you your training towards your skirmisher fighting style. Wilderness navigation, uh you know, so it's all it's all there as a path versus an actual um, full on class, mm -hmm. uh, a, a full on archetype. And so, depending on how you want to be, if you want to be a ranger that has a lot of spell usage, mage, and then scout path. You want to be the the fighter uh, scout who you're really focusing on your martial abilities. You can do that too. Um, if you want to be um, Again, you, you actually, like, you know, I know Rangers in more recent, uh, uh, you know, like 5th edition, they get their Animal Companion. I know other versions used to have the Animal Companion with the Druid. Again, that's that's a path. Uh, we do allow people to take uh, up to two paths, though there is a, there is a drawback. Uh, your second path costs extra AP than normal to, uh, to level up because you are now splitting your focus. But, you know, people can still be the ranger with the pet if they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I do believe that's also the only pet that has its own fighting style in there. Mm -hmm. Like we create, I created uh, a old, its own fighting style just for this pet. Right. Uh, that is uh, that is the case at this moment. Yep, mm -hmm. the skirmisher fighting style. Which I'm guess I'm guessing somebody could somebody could build around skirmisher in order to do a in order to do a ranger that um, puts a little bit more focus on trap building. Well, trap building is a skill, mm -hmm. so anybody could do it, but if that's what you wanted to do, then absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the skirmisher fighting style is focused on uh, ambushing, um, hit and run guerrilla tactics, things like that. Yeah. Um, so... T Given given all of the given all of that, the next one on the list is um, sorcerer, and in, instead of focusing on the so, on the sorcerer kit specifically, because especially since there especially since there's a wide amount of variants depending on which which edi which edition you're looking at. Although I've I have heard that Skip Williams absolutely hated sorcerers back in third edition, uh, which. <laughs> Is understandable to a point because just just pure th original third edition sorcerers kind of stunk. Uh, they didn't qu they, if I'm being honest, they didn't quite get 
good until Pathfinder. Like, 3.5 <laughs> Sorcerers were slightly better. But I could see the argument that was made at the time of a Sorcerer ju just feels like a gimped version of a Wizard. I don't completely agree with I don't completely agree with it, but I could see why people would would make that argument back in 2000. But I'd like to focus on on two particular pillars. One, the concept of they get their magic because of the, because of their bloodline and and um it is a natural kind of magic for for them. And two, the notion that they don't really cast the spell so much as they uncork it, like uncork, like opening up a shaken up soda can. So, well. <laughs> we don't have anything like that. You're either a mage or you're divine. Mm -hmm. There's no, currently right now, we have no uh, one in there. I think we are, right now I will say this. We are looking at uh, a version. We have, we've thought of that. Um, that works where um, I guess either like a witch. So, uh, if I can jump in real quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have we have like Jimmy said we have our mage and then we have our priest. So if you are an arcane caster. Um, it is something you're born with. Again, it requires you to take the talent at character creation of magic potential. Uh, just minimal level. Again, you can take the higher ranks if you want to be a stronger caster from the outset, but minimal level. Um, and that is straight up, that's what you're born with. The arcane caster gets uh, what we call spell manipulations, which are kind of like the sorcery point stuff. You know, double casting, quickening, um, but also maintaining a spell so it lasts longer. Um, things like that empowering the spell to do more damage all that kind of stuff um and then of course the divine which they get their powers from their god we do have planned again as as an expansion because we can't quite fit everything uh we have plans to work on an occultist uh slash like witch warlock type character which, where they have their powers granted from like uh, a deity adjacent you know kind of creature um you know some kind of you know patron so to speak um but right now we want to we were, we're looking at that and we're like well how can we make it feel different enough from the other two that it's worth it um you know or is it something that maybe we put in as an advanced archetype you know or or a path or something like that we're we're not 100 percent sure on that that one's still being developed so it's not it's not ready for the for a final release with the core book but that is something that could be seen in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so next, uh, next on the list is war is warlock, but you already you already kind of answered that with the with yep. what you mentioned previously. Yeah. Uh, so that would leave the last one, which is wizard. Yep. So you know, wizard and sorcerer are kind of one in the same in our system. It's just the mage. Mm -hmm. Um, again, we don't have spell slots. Once you learn a spell, you just know it and you always have access to it. So you can, you know, once you have learned it and wrote it down on your character sheet, you know, you can cast it whenever you want using mana. And then if you want to use your spell manipulations to, uh, empower, extend, maintain, uh, even rebound or redirect, you know, in case you miss with a spell attack, you can send it to another target or back to the same one. What it ends up being is uh, there's no points to use. It actually is just a uh, you spend extra mana, and that's based on the spell that you cast. And the manipulation says spend an extra fifty percent or twenty five percent or whatever the case may be mm -hmm. for for you know what what you already cast for the spell. So it'll be harder to um, empower or redirect or maintain the more powerful spells that are already mana intensive, but for the smaller spells it's easier so it scales mm -hmm. yeah and i think because we've added a lot because we made the mage so malleable that we really didn't have to break it out to well if you want to do this you have to go here if you want to do this you have to go here because um, again it's kind of like we wanted to make it like all-encompassing like 
how you decide to build your mage is how you decide to build your mage. Yep. But and, magic is magic. <laughs> right. Mag exactly. Magic is magic. Um, and again, when you start seeing, I think when people start looking at what manipulations they can choose and then how, what spell colleges they have and how that works. And once they understand how, how it, they can synergize the two, that's to me is when it starts getting exciting. One of our play testers, he's like, Oh, if I can do poison sphere and I can do this, but then I also take the lingering effect and I can do this, then it's even, even better. So when you start seeing, as Jason said, right, the cylinder start firing and how they can do this, I think that really opens it up to where you don't need all those little other branches to go. You can actually just do it on this one, depending upon the choices that you make. Yeah, and um, with now... One that's one that's not one of these standard ones, but it, but has made en has made enough appearances that I'm curious how you get how you guys would handle is a few. These are not ex these are not classes per se, but just a few concepts, and I'm curious how this would be handled in your in your se in your guys' setup. Um, one of them is the artificer, and the way I the way I often des describe the concept of the artificer is that even though they have even though they're associated with magic they're not the kind of person who would throw a fireball they would be, they would build a gun that throws fireballs <laughs> yeah so um we have the alchemist and um our alchemist kind of takes you know the artificer and anything that really is for me this was one of the things that I was really adamant about having as an archetype because there was a discussion. Is it an archetype? Is it a path? Um, for me, I thought there was enough with it that it warranted being a full on archetype. So with ours, um, when you decide that you want to be an alchemist, you decide what is your alchemical specialty. And that kind of determines whether you're an artificer or like a, um, a physician, uh, a poisoner, there's so uh, an engineer, like anything that kind of has to do with science is our alchemy. So, uh, again, so you can choose to specialize in alchemical constructs. So you can make golems. Um, you can make uh, clockwork beings like that is that's where you focus on that kind of engineering aspect of it. Um, you can. Um, so I'm sorry, let me let me start from the top. So you can be a cipher, a cipher is your alchemical expertise you focus on creating elixirs that um produce spell-like effects they are not spells but they do um have their own uh flair to them that like you can see the scientific aspect of it so like for example there's um there's a an elixir called static shock it produces a spell-like effect where you touch a target and it can zap them with some electrical damage, but it actually it says in there, like, it changes your biochemistry to generate an electrical field and yada yada. That's how, the, you know, that's how the effect goes. So we also have the Grenadier who focuses on creating various types of grenades from regular frag grenades to poison grenades, smoke grenades, um, and, and combining different effects using grenades. Physician who focuses on being a medical professional, creating healing tonics um, and using uh, medicine. A distiller who focuses on creating poisons uh, or even um, anything that can be distilled, so liquors and beer and things like that. Um, knows how to use a lot of uh, herbs for those effects. And then a thaumaturge who uh, focuses on um, their... Uh, their uh, em uh engineering so that was that was the engineering one so they get bonus for creating alchemical constructs and and using their engineering focus mm -hmm. so the other one that i'm cur that i'm curious about would be the magus the the Ma it's known as the magus in pathfinder it's been known as the so as the sword mage in the, in the most litigious game um, basically, the gish. Well, there's. I think there's a couple ways you could do that. We uh, we have 
obviously you could go um, just take your major talents and be a fighter. Uh, and I think we also have within there where you can, if you don't want to do majory, we allow you to just, is it empowering your weapons, Jason? Is that what we had it as? Yeah, so the very... F yes, there's just a way that you can focus on just using, instead of casting spells, using spells to enter into your weapon and do it that way. Uh, because again, because everybody can use magic. Uh, now, and again, like I say, you have access to all the magic. So just because you're a fighter doesn't mean that you're just relegated to these schools. Uh, I think you're probably actually even probably more so. Uh, I think you're going to be probably more equipped to be a quote unquote Magus or uh, which said the Gish uh, in this system uh, than any other one. Because again, mm -hmm. the freedoms that the freedoms that it allows. Because I think we have twenty, eighteen or twenty colleges, so you're free to do a lot if you just decide to focus on if you decide to take spells as yep. just a fighter. And then you can also, again, you can do that with the divine. You can be a fighter and take the divine favor talents to gain a few divine abilities, similar to what a priest would get. Mm-hmm. So there's even that is split that way. Like you don't have to be a priest to have the the favor of a god. There are, are plenty of times within various RPG lores where it's like, hey, I'm I'm this assassin, but but this the god of murder has like granted me his favor. I don't worship him. I, it just so happens that I do what he likes. Um, uh, and if not with assassins, fighters, rogues, uh, paladins. I mean, there's there's plenty of things where it's like it's not just the people who are in the religion can gain gain the attention of a god or a goddess. Mm -hmm. uh, now what the reason why I brought up the Magus in particular is one of its signature things is storing um, spells within the, within their particular weapon and, and the spell going off when they hit with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that again, like Jimmy said, there is the uh, the basic level of uh, of requiring the basic level of magic does give you the uh, imbue ability where you can just channel that energy straight into your weapon, and basically if you hit with your weapon attack, it'll also deal the spell damage as well. However, if you miss with the attack, your spell damage gets w wasted. So, so it's a, it's a risk reward setup, which I al I always love those kind of things. Well, yeah, we're not going to let you just throw an extra 3d6 on a sword and just keep swinging it until you actually hit something. I mean, that's kind of silly. Everyone would do it then. True. Then again, then again, ever, then again, everyone keeps playing two, keeps playing two Gish-esque um, classes so so much. So, so Mulligan. True. 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 Good counterpoint. Um. But with the, with that in mind, um, do you guys have do you guys have a launch date in, in mind as far as when you're going to relaunch the Kickstarter, or or whichever crowdfund you end up using? Because there's options these days. Right. Um. I don't know. I think maybe we were thinking now that we actually have uh, some people in place now. Uh, sure that fiasco we did lose our. I shouldn't say a fiasco. We did unfortunately lose um, our layout artist and some of the other people due to uh, health reasons. So we had to spend some time on trying to find that. And <clears throat> RPG layout artists are a very small niche community. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're extremely busy now. <laughs> As we pointed out, <laughs> everyone is doing it. So it's, it's tough to actually find them. So I think lessons learned from what we did last time. Uh, I think this year we're going to take a little more time, get everything out, because now we really have everything down. And then I think maybe in the s spring of next year, maybe sooner, but uh, really we want to have the marketing budget in place that we were really lacking last year. Uh, we really learned a lot about marketing, and I would say to anybody that listens that is looking to do this, uh, marketing is key and putting aside a good marketing 
junk for marketing is 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 a big deal. And that is one yeah. one lesson that we learned the hard way. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And with and with that in mind, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how it develops and how and especially how people find creative ways to hack it. Uh, man, so I will say I can give you two real quick stories. The first time we did this, uh, and again, this was on a one shot because we did a lot of one shots because we wanted to see how things would work. So please keep that in mind. Is that we had uh, one of my friends who was running a mage with a bear. He had a bear as a beast companion. And these guys were running towards, I forget what was attacking anyway. And I asked Steve, I said, well, what are you doing, Steve? And he says, well, I'm casting mage armor on the bear. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Turn goes on. Steve, what are you doing? Well, Jimmy, I'm casting haste on the bear. Oh, okay. Not thinking anything of this. Still running the combat. They're doing the thing. Steve, what are you doing? Well, Jimmy, I'm going to take my remaining spell points and enlarge the bear to, I think he made it colossal size. So, <clears throat> that was a great hack. Mm-hmm. So I had a very fast, very large bear that just completely destroyed my encounter. <laughs> so, I was like, okay. Kudos to that. And then we did have a gentleman um, who we see every year at Southern Fried Gaming, uh, Paul, who um, never, without fail, sits down at our table, which we love, goes through all our stuff. We get to see that childlike wonder and amusement when he gets it. We'll mark it down, and then we know somewhere within our within our campaign that we're going to run in our playtest, Paul is somehow going to find a loophole and exploit it. And he has come up with some really good ones, that, so much so that we've had to change it. I think the first one was with Levitate, Jason? Uh, reverse Gravity. Reverse Gravity, because we did not explicitly say you had to pick a point on the ground. So with that, his loophole was, I'm going to pick the point where Reverse gravity spell stopped and then double it. Since you did specify it had to be in the ground, you'd say I couldn't do it in the air. Yep, cast the second one, and it started right where the first one ended. Sent our big bad up, like, 100, 200 feet in the air, and then just went, I dropped the spell, let the creature fall. Creature had... In our game, falling damage is nasty, so... Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. Killed, our, so, he killed our big baddie and with two spells. One shot. Yeah. Yep. yeah. <laughs> uh, un- understand- understandable. But uh, like I said, I will be looking forward to seeing how things develop. And with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you very much. And any time, like I say, we, we enjoy hearing from you. We really enjoy speaking to you. You are a plethora of knowledge on this. Uh, and you're we always just wonderful learn something to talk to about we... this. Yeah, and we really enjoy speaking to you about just RPGs in general. I mean, you, you're this is this is awesome. So thank you. Yes, and... uh, definitely appreciate it. it. It's been a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>